Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, boy, you guys are in for a shocker this evening. And, you know, as I've told you, I've been doing a lot of research right now. And I'm going back and I'm looking at our biblical passages. And of course, Joel just really stands out. Um, chapter 2 specifically. And, uh, and, and then I'm thinking along the lines, too, of all the great wars that... Yahweh has fought on behalf of Israel, um, such as the, the walls of Jericho, uh, the Red Sea crossing and the, uh, the ocean parting open and then the ocean closing back in upon the enemies. There, there's so many supernatural type battles that it did not surprise me when I read over here in the book of Judges that they fought from heaven, the stars and their courses fought, not against, but with Caesarea. All right. They fought with him against Israel. Who? These stars. Who were the stars? The kings that came, that fought, the, that fought the kings of Canaan and Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. But they came, and of course those courses are like stairways, like a ladder, like what Jacob saw when he was there at Jerusalem, and he said there was a ladder up into heaven, and the angels were ascending and descending upon it. You know, we tend to not realize the magnitude of the supernatural and the different um, battles that were taking place down through the history of the earth and even will in the future uh, we tend to underestimate that. We read it more like a Bible fairy tale and not really consider the magnitude of some of these battles that took place on the earth. And tonight, I want to take you in to the magnitude of the battles themselves. So sit back and let's look into this from a scriptural standpoint. And from here... We're going to Joel chapter 2. All right, guys. So let's, as I said, let's go to Joel chapter 2 here. We're going to be looking at scriptures in a way that is going to no doubt really challenge us as believers. Um, and it shouldn't, no. Let me just say that from the very beginning here. It should not challenge us we should just realize that the, the Bible account of things that took place was not a fairy tale. You know, we're talking about real battles, real things that took place. We're talking about, um, you know, for example, if you just look at the battles where Yahweh, for example, battles for Israel, uh, they leave Egypt, they go to the Red Sea. In fact, on our, on our channel here, Israeli News Live, if you go there, if you scroll down to popular uploads, there's one called the trailer, Yom Suf, Israel's Final Exodus. That is actually a trailer that was based on the book I wrote called Yom Suf, Israel's Final Exodus. Uh, you could look that up. You can, I think you can still purchase the book. Uh, but even in this here, I was examining the ancient account in light of a cyclical event through, through, uh, through the idea of a future exodus, that it just mirrored that because Moses called the Red Sea Yam Suf, a sea of reeds. Who knows? I may find some new things with the way that God has been dealing with my heart on things now. But anyway, I go into Leonard Muller's, not so much Leonard Muller, it's actually Ron Wyatt's discovery, but Leonard Muller and Vivica Pontian and the documentary The Exodus Revealed, uh, put a lot of things together there. But there it is right there. That's that image right there of crossing the Red Sea. What type of event was it that caused that to happen? You know, I mean, think about it. You know, things were very supernatural, uh, very supernatural during that time. And so, you know, I was, when I wrote this book, you know, I was, of course, dealing with uh, like I said, the cyclical, cyclical events of this time. But the thing is, is that uh, we are dealing with a time and, you know, a time frame that we're living in, in biblical periods. We are dealing with, uh, we're dealing with supernatural things that God would do. And 
if God was doing supernatural things, or Yahweh, I should say, if Yahweh was doing supernatural things that would cause uh, such unbelievable, unparalleled things to happen on the earth, did we think that that, that Yahweh was only battling against uh, some backwards nations that ran around with clubs on their backs and things like that? Of course not. Of course not. What's he battling against? He's battling against Nephilim nations, as we already know, because uh, you look at look at them. Look at the advancement of Egypt, and even in the hieroglyphics, some of the things that are there. I mean, it's very evident that. Some of the things that were on there with the, for example, with, with the, uh, with the, uh, in, in the case of the, the time that, that, that you go back and you look there, well, I get my, lose my train of thought there, so <laughs> I apologize for that, but God, you know, Yahweh was was dealing with with giants. He's dealing with nations that no doubt were Nephilim. And if they're Nephilim, like for example, in the in, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, chapter eighteen or, or Leviticus one, where it says Anak, not Enoch, but Anak. Uh, maybe I'll just pull that up just so we kind of know this for a fact. You know, he is a, and I think it's the book of Numbers, chapter thirteen, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just quickly look there. Um, yes, right here. All right. So, and there was, there, there we saw the Nephilim. Now, these are the spies that spy out the land, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim. Now, that's how they show you in English. Or I think you have giants in the English language, right? In the most Bibles. But this is what you have to look at. All right. There is Hanephilim. Notice right there, that little Yod. And then, but but he is Bene Anak, the sons of Anak, and Anak is from Ha Nephilim. They put the vowels in the wrong place. There is no Yod there. So if it's spelled differently for the time of Moses, if he puts that the children of Nephilim, which they were, his sons were Nephilim, but Anak himself, he is from the Nephilim, the fallen angels. That means then that fallen angels were definitely coming down on the earth during the time of Israel's encampment. And this is during the, all right, look, this is a time when the spies are spying out the land. So you got to think deeply about this, very deeply, when we're looking at this. So that's why I'm telling you, as we look at Joel, it's going to be challenging, but at the same time, what's the difference with like Judges? Judges tells us right here, they fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against, not against, but with Em, right, right there, Em, Sisera. That's not against, they fought with him, those stars, who are the stars? The kings came, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. The kings came, they fought. That, now that's interesting. The kings came, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan. You ever notice, notice that right there? Bo melechim nelechamu. Right there. Now, that's interesting. And the kings came. And we just think of it like, okay, the kings came and then the kings fought Canaan and Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. What kings came? The stars. And where did they come from? They came from heaven. They come from another dimension. The word course is there. And the Hebrew word right there uh, that we have here, that salut can be a, a passageway, a stairway, a portal, dimension, all kinds of things. My point is, if Yahweh is having to fight supernatural battles for the sake of Israel's protection, he's not fighting against an enemy that just has no problem. I mean, come on, people, wake up and think about it. When Moses and Aaron go down and they take a stick and it can turn into a snake, that isn't some cheap magician trick. In Pharaoh's own 
Enchanters are able to do the same thing. Moses can take a stick, strike the water, it turns to blood. They can do the same thing. We're not dealing with just any kind of battles then. But we're reading them like fairy tales or little children's bedtime stories when reading the Bible. And the thing is, we shouldn't be reading it as a bedtime story. All right? I want to show this then now. Now, with that in mind, let's look again. As I said, if you look at Joel chapter 1, grain shrivel under their hoes, the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, the corn is withered. How does the beast groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. Why are the barns broken down? Fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Flames have set ablaze all the trees of the field. Yea, the beasts of the field pant unto thee, for the water of the books have dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. It is setting you up to show you the events that were happening before, in my opinion, and this is just a conjecture, before the passing of what could have been Planet X in those days. If you remember... Now, I think actually this is more prophetic. Joel is prophetic. But Joel also knows what happens from the stories that were passed down to the children of Israel. They know that this is going to happen again. You're going to see that in Joel chapter 2. Blow you the horn in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mouth, and let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day the Lord cometh, for it is at hand. A day of what? Darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness as blackness spread upon the mountains. A great people and a mighty there hath not been ever like, neither, sh neither shall be any more after them, even to the years of many generations. That's your clue right there. Verse 2. One clue. All right, that's one clue. What do I mean by one clue? Even to the years of many generations. Lo Yosef ad shenel dor vedor. Not just years, but generations and generations. It doesn't actually say the word many generations. Generations upon generations. And this is what we know even about the passing of planet X. It's ever so many thousands of years. Now, I believe that there is one, um, one man that does a lot of work on this, that he actually believes it's, it's every so many hundreds of years. I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that this is not is a great... Now, and here's the other part too, by the way. Clouds of thick darkness, blackness spread upon the mountains... Let you know that something is coming is going to block the light of the sun. A great people, Amrav, U Saum Kamaho, Kamoho. Do you know there? It's not even Adom. It's Am, just a people. Rav, Rav is many. But if you really take this compounded word here, they only basically translate one word in there, mighty, right? Mighty. But if you put the two words together there, which is not translated to English, they just say a great people and a mighty. There have not ever been the like. The, the next part there has not never been the like is that part right there. Lo nihaye min haulam. And it doesn't even say there have not ever been the like. It just simply... Well, yeah, I guess that the ever, right? Ha'olam. No, in other words, no, it will never be from this forever. All right? That's a little bit more literal translation. But these two words right here isn't just to say mighty. I did a Google Translate for you just so you could kind of get a better idea, right? I put those two words together right there for you, okay? I'm going to highlight. Oh, won't let me highlight them. Atsum komahu, enormous. That is probably a better translation for the Hebrew words. Enormous. Because you put them together. Not just to, they only translate it as sum. All right? Sum is what they're using for mighty. 
But when you put atzum, komahu, it is like the great as of what is the greatest. There are people that are just huge. That's what he's saying. So he's saying right there, a great people and a mighty, great in numbers, but not just in numbers, but the fact that they're enormous. Some, some of them are even enormous. You could even translate that as some of them are enormous. Maybe not all of them, but some of them are. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after them. Wow, they come and then they leave? Even in the years of many generations. Now, Get this though, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame blazeth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing escapeth them. Just the ride of their planet coming by. Now it doesn't say anything about a planet here. I'll agree with that. But it's describing them. And it's not finished yet. Verse 4. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses. Komre, komre, susim, susim is horses. Marehu. Literally, it's the, it's, the, it's the reflection of them, the image of them. It's like, it's like the, word, the word here is like, uh, is like an image. You can, appearance is, is correct as well. Nothing wrong with the word appearance. But in other words, these people, not only are they enormous, but they're, they, they're, they, they kind of resemble like a horse. Now, we automatically just think, you know, we look at, it, oh, they, 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 okay, they look like a horse. Well, that's not a per person don't look like a horse. Maybe it just means a lot of, no, it's giving you the appearance or the reflection of the horse. But notice that it says, and as horsemen, so do they run. All right? Ve'rotzon. Ve'rotzon. Roots is for the word, the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for running, right? They run. And, and of course, it's pluralized. Uh, well, they run is, is, you know, meaning, yes, pluralized because it's they. Because they run. Kin yotzon. That's giving you the idea like a horseman, in other words, they have the appearance of a horse, muscular like a horse, I guess you would think of it, but they can run like a horse man. In other words, they can get up on their their two back legs or their two, two legs, period, and they can run. All right, let me, let, me, let me share with you why this matters so much, right? Now, we're just going to look at images, right, from Google here. Let's see, I think, let's ask, here we go. I've had one friend of mine that has seen, we have one reptilian that is in captivity. When I say captivity, probably was put in prison for some reason or whatever. But their face, uh, as I was told, is similar to that of a lizard, but that does similarly, somewhat looks like a man. And I was told that their muscular, uh, this is kind of probably exaggerated look that you see here. But I was told like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday. I was also told, though, they run about nine feet in height. And their skin is much like that of a lizard, is what they tend to... And their heads are more like a lizard head. All right? But now, in this one here, you get that the legs being much more muscular, things like that. I, I don't say it's exactly the right way of an image to look, but that is supposed to, you know, give you some kind of idea. So if you think about a reptilian, in other words, my thought is that a reptilian would fit that description much better. The fact of what's happening could fit the passing of their demonic planet. And maybe this is what Yahweh is having to protect Israel against, is, is this entity coming. I mean, what a battle. What a, what a demonic, satanic battle that Satan is fixing to wage against the people of the earth. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, when it comes to Jesus standing for his own, 
We're talking about something completely different altogether. But I'm showing you just this demonic thing that it seems to be described in the book of Joel. Now, going into verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, do they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as mighty people set in battle array. At their presence, the peoples are in anguish and all faces have gathered blackness. Now, by the way, that literally means that they're, they're, the vehicles that they are in can just go from the top of one mountain to the top of the next. That is no joke. Just boop, like a skip, just boop, right on over the top to the other next one. They're literally, the weapons that they have is actually described as it, like if it were a spear, a tip of a spear that shoots out some type of a flame. And I read this and I'm, I'm really, I, I am perplexed at what Joel is trying to describe. And then he says, the peoples are in anguish. I mean, granted, I've been told from people that have actually seen reptilians, if this is indeed what Joel is t trying to describe when he talks about them being like horses, you know, their appearance being like horses. Um, and, I, and, I, and my only concession is that he's describing, you know, the strength of it, the muscular side of it. Uh, and of course, the fact that they're nine foot in length. If you take a horse, stand him up on his, on his hind legs, he'd be well, probably over nine foot in height because that would really put him on out there. He'd probably about 12 foot in height, right? So, but nonetheless, very, very fearful looking creatures. Then notice in verse 10. Let's start with verse nine. Wait a minute. Um, no, let's go. I apologize. Verse eight. Neither doeth one thrust. Back up to verse seven. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. And though they move on everyone on his way and they entangle not their paths. Neither doeth one thrust another. They march everyone in his own highway and they break through the weapons and suffer no harm. Literally, our modern day weaponry has pretty much no effect on them. They leap upon the city, they run upon the wall, they climb up into the houses, they enter in at a window like a thief. Before them the earth quaketh. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are become black and the stars withdraw their shining. Again, Lifnav, you know, before their face. In other words, this literally... It's, it's not just the word before. Livnav is like before your face. Oh, hang on, we're losing light, guys. My apology, I'm sitting here reading all this and I realize the light is quickly going dim in here. We are literally getting a description when it says before the face, if you translate it like that, lifnav. It is, in other words, before they get here, the earth is going to quake. The heavens are going to tremble. Asteroids, meteorites, things like that. The sun and the moon are going to become black. Why? Because the planet will literally black out the light that they're going to be giving off. And then we read verse 11. And the Lord, Yahweh, Yehovah, however you want to pronounce that, uttereth his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is mighty that executed his word. For great in the, is the day of the Lord, and very terrible. Who can abide in it? Yet even now, saith the Lord, turn you unto me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with lamentation. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, long-suffering and abundant in mercy, and repenteth him of the evil. Now, 
this is a challenging part of the chapter. I feel like this could be separate from everything we just read. And at the same token, I also realize Satan will try to bring in an Antichrist system and they're going to tell you, unless you return to the law of the Old Testament and the rabbis of Israel, there's not going to be any mercy for what's coming. That's the great deception. That's the great deception, friends. I know that the Antichrist figure is going to claim to be Yahweh. I realize, and I'm going to get an update on this very soon, about the, the Saudi guy. I'm going to try to get some of these pieces put together. I have a report myself that I have to deliver. Um, so I am very much interested in some of the responses on these things. But I, as I said, though, as you start to begin to look at uh, chapter 2 near the end, now it's like, okay, this is what you have to do in order to have mercy. And of course, Yahweh fought for Israel back in those days. And we did see in the times of Egypt, the darkness that came into the land, the death angel, the, the, the meteorites that were hitting the, the places, the animals that were dying, the diseases, all kinds of supernatural things were taking place. No question about it. But I think that's where we're headed again. And I'm concerned. Also, speaking about the earthquake, remember what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 24. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all, uh, of all nations for my name's sake, right? Many false prophets shall arise. So he warns us about the betrayal of the believers and what's going to happen. You get all the way down to verse 36, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not into the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. Noah's day, that marriage, eating and drinking, was cannibalism and the marriage of fallen angels to earthly women. So just remember that. Remember, if nothing else, you remember of what I say tonight. The Bible is not a fairy tale. It is not a little children's book. There were real as we can clearly see here in the book of Numbers, there were fallen angels because Anak, right here, Anak, he is from the fallen ones. That is literally what that means. Okay? That's exactly what that means. They did the vowel points wrong because the rabbis... We're not looking at what's really going on. And maybe they didn't want to. I don't know the answer to that. But we see it there. We see it in Ezekiel. Uh, oh, actually, oh, oh, I, saw, I didn't go into that with you guys. Let me just quickly touch on Ezekiel. Judges is what I meant to say. We saw it in Judges. The, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought with Sisera, not against him, but with him. And they were battling against Israel then. Yahweh was having to fight these fallen angels then. All right. And in closing, uh, let me just share this with you real quick. This is actually from the Damascus document. Uh, just an English version real quick. I'll just share that with you. Where it talks about in, uh, let's see, this is in the rules of the community. CD uh, 25310. Column 10 would be where that's at. Uh, and their sons, uh, whose height was like that of the cedars and whose bodies were like mountains. Okay? That's how big they were when they failed. They, they, when they failed, their bodies was like the size of mountains. 
Uh, just in closing, I'll just share this with you. Ezekiel chapter 36, right? Thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy has said against you, aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Think about it. You already know who the mountains are. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, because even because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, that you might be a possession to the rest of the nations, and you are taken up in the lips of the talkers and evil report of the people. Who was the one doing all this devouring? It was the Nephilim. They were devouring them even before the flood. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the streams, to the valleys, to the desolate waste, to the cities that are forsaken, which are become a prey and derision and a residue of the nations, and that are round about. All right. Did, now, let me see. Hang on. Uh I, I was bringing up, but as actually, I think it is, that that's still important right there, but uh, that's just one of the types there. Those mountains, I believe, are the representation of the Nephilim that are fallen. Uh, they were the ones that made them desolate. But if you remember, after the flood and the Ark of the Covenant came out, uh, and let's see, what do I have on here, Joel? Okay, never mind, I already know what that is. Let me just quickly, we'll do this real quick. Ararat. Okay, in Genesis 8.4, And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventh day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. All right, how can one little ark that's only 450 feet long sit on mountains, plural, of Arat. Actually, the Hebrew word in, in this very Genesis here in the Hebrew uh, Dead Sea Scrolls was Harat. Not Ararat, but Harat. And it actually says the mountains of Harat. Harat means the mountains of the cursed. When Moses' ark rested, it rested on the bodies, on top of those bodies. Of course, they were probably covered with certain dirt and everything, so now they look like mountains. Uh, and, and just another fascinating thing. I think I've already shared that with you, but I figured I'd just say that in closing and appreciate it. Also, uh, a couple of things real quick. I have not talked about EMP Shield in a long time, uh, and this is probably not the best video to do it in, but they do have a New Year's sale, so let me bring it up to you real quick. Uh, as well as our website. I, I really want to thank you guys for your love and your support of this ministry. Uh, if you've never given, you want to be a part to help us out, our website is israelinewslive.org. You can click right there on the right and you can donate online. It allows you to go right there to the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Or if you want to do it by mail, you're able to do that on our website, our, our mailing address. You can do it at Dunan Institute if that's uh, good for you. Or even in my own name, which appears on the top of the video, Stephen Benoon at P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. But the thing about the EMP shield, uh, I just did a video over on Patreon talking about the quakes that they're anticipating. Probability. Now remember, probability doesn't mean absolutely 100% will. But I understand now why the scientists are freaking out about what is happening and what their projections are about storms and, and electrical events that are going to be we're facing here on the earth. Uh, they're fearful, like like unbelievably so. It's one reason why I'm I'm kind of volunteer to help look at the ancient biblical side of things to see if there's something that might matter. Uh, so I think the idea of an EMP shield is critical. By the way, if you notice, there are no new cars practically nowhere right now. They blame it on, oh, we can't get the chip from China. We could back, we could, we could easily back engineer chips and already had the cars going again. That's the excuse, friends. They know something's coming that's going to cause your car to completely fry itself out. 
So you can protect your vehicle with an EMP shield. And I have it on my car. Actually, I have a truck, but I have it on my truck. Um, right now it's $389, but I see that they have the New Year sale is on. So if you were to get one, you add it to your cart uh, right there. You want to go to the cart. You can already see you got a discount from them. So it drops to $369, $20. But if you use our, our coupon code right here, when it says apply a coupon code, it's INL50 for Israeli News Live 50. You apply that coupon, they're going to discount it 50 more dollars for you for that same item. And now it drops down to $319. And they do, have, they got all kinds of crazy stuff. So depending on if you're a prepper or something, you're into different types of things. You got home protection, vehicle, RV plug-in, generator, solar wind and protection, radio protection, three-phase protection, European bundles, etc. Everything you can imagine. So I'm, you guys know I'm not a salesman. I don't like doing sales and stuff. Uh, it, they do support the work we do here when you buy it. So yes, it does help us. So if you're, if you are the type, uh, you just need that, and you would like it to benefit uh, Israeli News Live as well, the work we're doing, it would do that automatically. But I don't like to pound on you guys and tell you about these things all the time because that's just not who I am. Uh, but when I know that there are things that I haven't had a chance to share with you yet. And I am concerned about you getting home, for example, because let's say there is some type of electric magnetic pulse or, and there, that threat is real, by the way. In fact, I've got a meeting coming up uh, tomorrow regarding Iran and Russia. They are increasing their ties and it's happening sooner than we thought. Uh, 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 Iran has a technology that would render our entire nation crippled. Even your house, electricity, even if you got solar panels. Uh, I've got solar panels, I've just never installed them. And I haven't done it for a reason. But, you know, if they're already installed, you want to have that EMP shield on there. That's just my opinion. It's kind of like insurance. Okay, so just a thought. Anyway, I'll quit beating that drum. Uh, I wasn't even planning on speaking about it, so I had to pull the website up. But it just come on my mind suddenly because I remembered the video on Patreon that I did yesterday. So again, and I'll put that link in here for you in the description as well. Patreon dot, uh, excuse me, dot, uh, Patreon forward slash Israeli News Live. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. And we love you. Good day.